Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Fiona Bennett. And I'm Michael Schaefer. Hi Fee, lovely to see you. How are you? I'm really well. I'm really all the better for seeing you, albeit still in two dimensions on this screen that I'm looking at. But I'm, yeah, very pleased to see you, Michael. How are you doing? I'm doing all right, thanks. Yeah, I'm uh, back in a rehearsal room uh, this week and next week, and that's that's great. That feels... That feels good to be doing the thing I do again, I suppose, yeah. Mm. Uh, and with old friends, uh, as well as some new ones. And yeah, that's, that's lots of fun. How are you, Fee? What have you been up to? Well, it's been quite busy. Been having a lovely time uh, attending some poetry events online. You know, it's uh, at the beginning I was very kind of, I, oh, I can't really do all this being at an event online. And as it's gone on, I've felt the need so much and then also there's been such phenomenal offers from people mm. i mean fantastic yeah i've i've resisted uh, a lot of the cultural online offerings but i did watch three kings by stephen beresford who we've had on the podcast starring andrew scott uh, who we've also of course had on the podcast and it was quite an extraordinary experience actually and i think maybe because it was made uh for purpose as it were you know it's this on camera season that the old vicar doing uh and it, i was yeah really blown away by it i thought it was terrific that's great um michael before we get into the episode proper as it were i i, I did just want to say it's been fantastic having such lovely feedback and comments from a few people who've been in touch yeah. directly and by Twitter and whatever. And just to really say thank you to those people who have been in touch. Thank you to everybody for listening. And just to let you know what a difference it makes to us to get those messages. And especially when they're really specific about what people are finding valuable and useful at the moment, you know, it's great to hear from somebody in Brazil who's listening mm. and finding that sense of connection and I guess community in a way which we're all needing to touch and feel in whatever way we can. Yeah, it really is heartwarming, isn't it, Fee, to, to receive those messages. So uh, thank you so much for, for people that have done that. So I think we should get on with this month's episode, Fee. I'm really excited that we've had this conversation and it, uh, without doing too much spoiler alert, expectation raising, uh, it was a very powerful conversation with a guest who is a master of powerful conversations himself mm. and a real privilege. And I really hope that that's going to resonate for everyone listening. Yes, you're teasing us now, Fiona. Um, uh, so uh, the conversation was with Podrick Otuma, who, if you haven't yet discovered his podcast, I strongly suggest you go and seek it out. It's called Poetry Unbound, uh, hosted by Podrick Otuma, and it comes out of the On Being stable of podcasts, if you will, uh, On Being fabulous podcast hosted by Krista Tippett. So you'll be hearing myself and Fiona talking about A Recovered Memory of Water by Nula Nihonel, translated by Paul Muldoon, the poem that's been a friend to Podrick. Now, we have got the poem that you've selected in front of us. Uh, I, w I wondered if I could ask you to read it out for us. Um, in English or in Irish? Would it be okay to have both? Yeah, lovely. Orinta Norvina Hinlin Sashomra Falka, a glana fiacla, a slave tiv is the sod bacala. Tegterdi, Galeanan and Shomra Sosleishka. Tustni and Shay, a gacossa, is a routine. Is vain shag sliberal sauce, a saucer rish, haramasi. Is a cramon, is a basta. Ne father, Gamin she sus gadi, a hiskadi, irhi. Cromin she she is own, Gaminic, a piocasus, rodi, mar, huali lava, new cartaha, tire my son. 
ta common family or who has got hog of father kelpo or the dog dish growing white and vara no herbal vadri rua or who on son go hoban ten on ishka in nisca ni father come in and shomra omlan trimrish tastros u fast ke grind lesh na mahu kan shogaler taration seal ni rod er be ache kan komparad a yen of lesh es nil na fakal karta er olis ache er karbe Egas eshun psychotherapy ek shaktanul bein a dochan doeche ek ira an scale ash doksha a vino is a chor in oil ek gart don vyar doktor nilain termiechteche na termi tagerhe na fakler be a hor chan torum slu da kade ishke lacht Three yarkach, had her she, a den of a cream dechel. Sha, had her in an therapy, crin of art. Been she a molla is all greasa con gne of tongan. Then in she ear of della, slave, slayed tummy, a hug and sheer. E a toriot got coramok in mask no vocal. Brat glenach. Over. Shiltach, Rod Fluch. That was extraordinary to mm. to hear, Podrick. Will I read the English version? Mm. Thank you. Sometimes when the mermaid's daughter is in the bathroom, cleaning her teeth with a thick brush and baking soda, she has the sense the room is filling with water. It starts at her feet and ankles and slides further and further up over her thighs and hips and waist. In no time, it's up to her oxters. She bends down into it to pick up hand towels and washcloths and all such things as are sodden with it. They all look like seaweed, like those long strands of kelp that used to be called mermaid hair or foxtail. Just as suddenly the water recedes and in no time the room's completely dry again. A terrible sense of stress is part and parcel of these emotions. At the end of the day, she has nothing else to compare it to. She doesn't have the vocabulary for any of it. At her weekly therapy session, she has more than enough to be going on with just to describe this strange phenomenon and to express it properly to the psychiatrist. She doesn't have the terminology or any of the points of reference any word at all that would give the slightest suggestion as to what water might be. A transparent liquid, she says, doing as best she can. Right, says the therapist. Keep going. He coaxes and cajoles her toward word making. She has another run at it. A thin flow, she calls it, casting about gingerly in the midst of words. A shiny film. Dripping stuff something wet. I just wanted to uh, to ask you, Podrick, just thinking that you're someone who knows so much poetry and who is reading so much poetry, what was your process to, to have to land in this instance on one it was difficult. I tried to think of what a, what's a poem that's been around with me for decades. And there were certain ones that came to mind. But Newland Neagonal had been the poet in residence in University College Cork when I was 13. And she came into our class to read. Um, she was magnificent. She came in and she was wearing kind of um, strong colours of blue and green. She looked like a mermaid almost. And the Irish language poetry curriculum had been revised that year. And her face was on the front cover of the Irish language poetry book. And so like suddenly this person who's on the front cover of our school book is standing in front of us, speaking in gorgeous Irish and reading the poems. And she read a poem about her father and she then looked at a translation of it and said, oh, there's a, there's a thing in the translation here that could have been more accurate. And it was that that made me go, 
wow, look at that. And so I knew when you wanted to ask about a poem that had been a friend that I wanted to choose one from Newell and Nicole. And I, I love I love the mermaid motif that she uses and how she speaks about mermaids. But um, this poem I've known for about 12 years since the book came out, but her work I have been thinking about since the late 80s. And she has been a, I think she was the first poet that I ever saw read. And I loved the, 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 the fluency of language, how she moved from Irish into English. She doesn't write in English. She insists on writing in language that she says might be dead before I am. And that urgency and that insistence is so important. She was born in England and then sent to grow up with some family in Ireland where she learned Irish. And so she also, in that moving between these two islands next to each other, has within her a story of migration and a story of the complexity about what does it mean for Irish people and English people to be in communication with each other about languages that are indigenous to the islands that we're in. And so in her person, in her language, in her art and in her magnificence, I was transfixed totally. And so I followed her work ever since I was 13. <laughs> I love especially that you've you've landed on this poem, which is, as you say, from, from a shorter amount of time than the than the beginning of the journey with her. But the yeah. image of her in the room in the colours mm. with the mermaid is is somehow the line that takes you right through. Oh, totally. I mean, my memory is now I could be making this up, but my memory is, is that she was wearing silver and blue and green and she had magnificent red hair and she owned the front of the room. And I remember being transfixed. My friend Cahill, um, later on when we were up at his house, he put on one of his mother's scarves and he did an impersonation of her because she was just so captivating in her presence in the room. I, I was transfixed by thinking, what does it mean to be a poet? And I loved poetry and was writing poetry myself at the time. I wasn't telling anybody, but I was writing it. And I, I, I never even thought I could ascend to the heights of personal presence that she had in front of the glass. I've never met her since. I'd love to meet her to tell her that I remembered that. Oh, I'm sure she'd gone into hundreds of glasses. I can't imagine she'd remember. You know I'm sure she would love to know the impact yeah. of it had on you. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell her about my friend pretending to be here later on as well, wrapped in his mother's scarf. <laughs> so tell us about mermaids while we're here. The fantasy of this book really is about the, the daughters of mermaids. And so um, Newell and Nicole is imagining that mermaids have come to land and have had children and they have not told their children about the fact that they're the children of mermaids. And so these children, on DNA level, have a memory of water in them, but not on a consciousness level. And she's using that initially to describe what it's like to be people where for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years a language has been spoken in Ireland that very quickly in the 20th century was being removed. You know, there might have been maybe 25% of the population at the start of the 20th century and by the end of the 20th century, in terms of first language fluency, that population was way, way down to less than 5%, I think. Um, and there's this invitation that she's offering to say that in as much as you mightn't have the conscious fluency that there is an indigenous intuitive memory of water in you of language and that when you hear it something happens to you and that that isn't listening to a foreign language that's listening to a language that your ancestors have spoken for centuries and therefore there's something in your body that remembers and you're you're made strange by it and you don't know what to do with it. So she's got all these mermaid poems in that collection. And what's really interesting when she speaks about it is that she says, you know, it started off as this metaphor for what it means to be a, a speaker or a lover or a learner of a language that shouldn't be a minority language because it's being spoken in the place where it's indigenous too, but it is because of the introduction and the imposition of the English language. Um, it started off with that, 
But the more she speaks about it, she says it kind of speaks about all kinds of level, levels of inherited loss and trauma. And she began to realize that people who came from other places who had other levels of inherited loss were saying, oh, this metaphor really works. And the displacement and the awkwardness that I feel about this thing that I feel like I should remember, but I don't. But nonetheless, I know something about it in my bones that they say we connect with your mermaid poems. And so she speaks very generously, I think, about recognising that this isn't just about the specifics of the Irish language in Ireland as a result of British-Irish relations over 400 years. She says that this is um, about something to do with the human condition, about what does it mean to remember things that you have never experienced, but that nonetheless are somehow in your soul, in your DNA, in your bones. There's, there's an entire PhD or an entire shelf of PhDs to be done on what that is. But one of the one of the things that that is, is an inheritance of a broken language. And when a people have to learn a foreign language in order to build and negotiate for their safety, that does something to the soul of a people. We have a phrase in Irish, Tir gan tanga, tir gan anam, a land without a language is a land without a soul. And and you see that as early as the 1600s, there's some formal policies written about the removal of Irish from the people. It's really interesting hearing you talk about that and having heard you read this poem in both languages. Um, and as somebody for whom words and language is their currency, that you know, it's your trade. It's starting to make clear to me, I suppose, the ways in which this is a very close friend to you. I mean, I started to learn Irish at the age of two. I was sent to a, a kind of, a, you could call it a kindergarten, but it wasn't anywhere near as organised. <laughs> I was looked after by a woman um, from West Kerry, from Carcagrina on the Dingle Peninsula, and she had no English. And so for two years, I was there for, I don't know, three or four hours a day. And um, all I heard from her was West Kerry Irish. And so I arrived in school not knowing that I spoke two languages. And when the teacher said to us, we're going to be learning a new language today, boys. She said, you know, it's a language called Irish, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then she said a few words and I was, I was so embarrassed because I understood. And she had said to us, you won't understand this. And I, I didn't understand that I could understand. And I thought <laughs> something's wrong. I've, I'm in trouble already. And so for me, language has always come, Irish language and English language has always come with this, with this worry. I have a worry that my grammar isn't great. And I have a worry that I wish I could speak Irish as fluently as I can speak English, even though I do have this queen anishka, this memory of water in me. And one of the things that's magnificent about the title, queen anishka, um, which Paul Muldoon has translated as a recovered memory of water. But Kleena, the word here for memory, not when it's written, but when it's heard, can also be the word for lament or keening or crying. It's one of the borrow words into English um, from Irish. Um, and so the the title of this poem is Kleena Nishka, Memory of Water, and also Kleena Nishka, Lament for Water, the keening of the water. It's tremendously moving, the the poem and, and how you speak about it, Podrick, and this sense of juxtaposition of the complete knowing in the body and the complete unknowing in the voice, um, or the uh, yeah, the lostness without the language is very yeah. very evident, isn't it? Very. And you speak of language there, Fiona, it's so important. Like, And she speaks about this, like in the second stanza of the poem. Tos nian se ag a cosa is a routini, is bian se ag sliberoil suus, is suus de rish, har a mossi is crumoin is a bosta. And then it starts at her feet and ankles and slides further and further up over her thighs and hips and waist. And then in no time it's up to her oxters. What a great phrase, up to your oxters. I don't know, do people use that in, in England? No, no. Well, not on a regular basis, definitely. Yeah, if you say here what's happening, you know, somebody, I'm up to my oxters in work. You know, <sighs> it just kind of means I'm drowning in work, you know. Hiskadi is the word um, that, that is translated by Paul Muldoon as oxters. Um, but Hiskadi, that word there, I-O-S-C, 
um, kind of to me sounds like the word in Irish for, for fish, which is I-A-S-C, isk. Ah. And so there's this way within which um, language is knowing itself without the person knowing itself, you know? Yes. Uh, and yeah. it, I love that. And it is so, you know, slippery and slithing and hips and thighs and waist. It's sensual, possibly, but she's not experiencing it as sensuality. She's experiencing it here as this um, strange memory and then suddenly it's gone. Her body knows something and her body doesn't know how to know that it knows something. Mm. And that's one of the things I think about trauma is that trauma is often stored in the body. Yeah. And this is a trauma for her, isn't it? It says a terrible sense of stress is part and parcel of these emotions. I know, yeah. This is painful. This is difficult. Yeah. 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 And then she's going to seek support for it. And she's got so much going on, you know, the way he says Paul Muldoon in the translation at her weekly therapy session, she has more than enough to be going on with. Um, and there's a sense of when your language is gone from you, how are you supposed to um, talk about it? And how are you supposed to describe that strange grief? You know, grief comes in all kinds of forms. And Sometimes you can have a grief that you can't justify by saying, look, this happened yesterday or last week or last year or when I was 10. This is a grief that she's inherited that she doesn't have a word for. And Nolan Nicole is describing that grief, I think, quite brilliantly in the idea of the fact that memory and lament can, to the ear anyway, sound like the same word in that word, koina. And, you know, one of the functions of poetry perhaps is to kind of crystallise a, a feeling yeah. or a, a something that we've gone through and, and, and kind of name it. And you go, oh, yeah, that's it. And when it's been yeah. given words to, then we can understand it, we can share it with other people then, you know. It's like when we can find the words, we have some power and we have a bit more agency in some way. Yeah, and you can feel noticed and you can feel like I'm not alone or you can feel... Um, a certain sense of connection. Um, I think language and poetry is in a certain sense both a prayer and an answer to prayer um, all at the same time. I'm not speaking about a God idea. I'm speaking about a prayer in the deepest yearning of the human spirit to call out for companionship, help, noticing, some sense of dignity in yourself. And when you read a poem or perhaps write a poem for yourself because you can't find one that's good enough to describe what's going on, that it, it functions both as the yearning and as an echo of that yearning at the same time. Nula Nihonal, translated by Paul Muldoon. A recovered memory of water. Sometimes when the mermaid's daughter is in the bathroom, cleaning her teeth with a thick brush and baking soda, she has the sense the room is filling with water. It starts at her feet and ankles and slides further and further up over her thighs and hips and waist. In no time, it's up to her oxters. She bends down into it to pick up hand towels and washcloths and all such things as are sodden with it. They all look like seaweed, like those long strands of kelp that used to be called mermaid hair or foxtail. Just as suddenly the water recedes and in no time the rooms completely dry again. A terrible sense of stress is part and parcel of these emotions. At the end of the day, she has nothing else to compare it to. She doesn't have the vocabulary for any of it. At her weekly therapy session, she has more than enough to be going on with just to describe this strange phenomenon and to express it properly to the psychiatrist. She doesn't have the terminology or any of the points of reference, or any word at all that would give the slightest suggestion as to what water might be. A transparent liquid, she says, doing as best she can. Right, says the therapist. Keep going. 
He coaxes and cajoles her towards word-making. She has another run at it. A thin flow, she calls it, casting about gingerly in the midst of the words. A shiny film. Dripping stuff. Something wet. And that was Fiona with the gift reading at the end there. Our thanks to Podrig for bringing us that fantastic conversation, um, for making time to speak to us, and indeed to Nulani Honnell for permission to share the poem. I've really loved listening back to this one, Fee. Podrick's such a brilliantly erudite man. I just, yeah, mm. really found myself getting kind of swept up in uh, in everything he was saying, really. I thought it was a fascinating conversation. He's, a, he's quite a brilliant man, isn't he? Absolutely, Michael. I think also what was just so wonderful was the way that he spoke so strongly through the poem itself. He said, you know, you, there could be a whole shelf of PhDs on the kind of territory that we were in talking about language and the kind of identity and what happens to identity when language is stolen from people. But he stays right within the imagery of the poem and the and what the this poet in particular writing in Irish means to him and means to his means to his soul, which was um yeah, it was just amazing. It was a really, really powerful way to to get closer and understand that very particular experience. Now, Michael, here's mm. a little um mystery trail for you. Excellent. And for our listeners, which is that there is another conversation in our archive, or I should say another poem in a previous episode, in which a mermaid features quite strongly. Oh, no, I can't think. <laughs> Shall we leave it as a teaser till the next ep? Yes, yes, do. I'll, I'll go away and put my thinking cap on. I won't cheat. No. Okay. And then uh, when we come back next time, if you haven't found it, I'll reveal all to you and our listeners. Very good, very good. Mm. So, Fee, we're coming towards the end of 2020. I think quite a lot of us will be pleased to see the back of it. But... We've got some ideas brewing about how we might try to be with people in 2021 in some new ways. So uh, if you want to sign up to the newsletter, you'll uh, get some more information about that as it comes out hot off the press. So wherever you are and whatever the next few weeks hold for you, we wish you and yours well and really look forward to being back with you in January. Until then... Thank you for listening. Mm-hmm.